Hi everybody, welcome back to Enchanted Bayou. Um, my name is Cassandra, if you're new here, welcome. Thank you for joining me. And if you've been here before, I really appreciate that and having you back and happy to see you all. It's been a while since I've done a video. I actually have had a lot of things going on. Uh, one, I got COVID for the first time, so I wasn't feeling very good for a couple of weeks. So I apologize, I'm feeling much better now though. Um, but yeah, I was out for a while. However, while I was down sick, I got addicted to watching the Alex Murdoch trial, and I'm going to talk about that a lot today. I don't know if you guys got a chance to watch some of the trial, or maybe you got crazy, watched all the trial, I don't know. But I am going to talk a lot about the timeline and everything here, because I think the timeline is really important, and fill you in on a little bit more of the details that they went over in the trial. It's just a really cool true crime murder case about a husband that just was found guilty of murdering his wife and his youngest son. Yeah, so we're going to do that. Now, I know that some of you are just here for the spirit box to hear what the spirits say to see if he's guilty because I, I love the spirit boxes and you know that all my videos for the most part have a spirit box session in it. So if you want to skip all this because you already have heard the whole trial or you already know all the details or anything like that, then I'm going to put the time up right here about when the spirit box session is going to start so you don't have to listen to me ramble on about all the details of this trial. Now, for those of you who are hanging in there with me and staying and we're going to talk about the story and everything, I actually this case was so detailed that some things came down to like 20 seconds in detail. So I actually took some notes. So I'm going to be referring to some of those while we're doing this because I would love to say, wow, I have this awesome memory and I memorized all of it for y'all. And I know a lot of it, a lot of it, but I don't have it all memorized. And you're here for the spirit box. See you later in the video and I will start talking about Alex Murdoch now. Now, Alex is from South Carolina. He's 54 years old. He had a wife named Maggie, and she was 52 years old. They've been together for a very long time. They have two sons. Buster is their oldest son, and I don't know how old Buster is, but Paul is their youngest son, and Paul is 22 years old. Buster's not too important in all this. He comes in a little bit, but for the most part, Buster is out of this. In February of 2019 is where this whole story basically gets started. His son, Paul, was in a boat accident, and he was accused of being the driver of the boat, and he was accused of being intoxicating while driving the boat, and he wrecked the boat, and it ended up resulting in the death of Mallory Beach, who was a 19-year-old girl that was with him that night, as well as a couple other friends that were there too, but it, the boat crash killed Mallory Beach. So because of the boat crash, Paul, the, the youngest son of Alex, was getting a lot of death threats, a lot of comments on social media. He was getting beat up, supposedly, when he would go out to bars or things like that. He'd go out to parties. He would get in fights over this boat accident. And the town actually was looking so down on the family that the mom started shopping at a different place altogether. She wouldn't shop at the same grocery store or anything like that. She would actually go further out of town to the next town over to shop. So it really affected their family. Now, the reason it was such a big deal that it affected their family is because their family, Alex's father and his grandfather, were the main prosecutors for their area since the 1920s. And it was from 1920 to 2006. So everyone knew this family. They were South Carolina royalty, I guess you could say, as far as attorneys and everything goes. Oh, and I forgot to mention that Alex is an attorney too. So yeah, so that's where the story starts with February 2019. Now, the next thing is that in May, Alex going on about his business and doing everything fine, he gets a text from his son Paul that mom, Maggie, has found some pills in his computer bag. Why is that a bad thing? Well, 
turns out that Alex actually had a pretty heavy, and I mean heavy, heavy, heavy addiction to opioids. Like $20,000 to $50,000 a month of pills. I can't even fathom doing that. But he was a very prominent attorney. He was making a lot of money, millions actually per year, and it helped support his drug habit. In May though, he gets that text from Paul about mom finding the pills and the prosecution argued that that was just more of his world kind of tumbling and crumbling. And the prosecution, this whole trial, talked about a gathering storm and how a lot of stuff was falling apart around Alex. And that's why, in the end, he eventually murdered his wife Maggie and his youngest son Paul. And we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a second. So, we know that Paul and we know that Maggie knew about his drug addiction. Supposedly, he had tried to get off his drugs before in the past and would get really sick and everything like that, and Maggie knew about that. Uh, but in May, he's confronted with it again. Then we get to June. Well, let's back up before June. So I talked about the addiction, and yeah, he was making millions, millions every year. I mean, this was a very, very successful attorney. And he had multiple properties, you know, his family didn't want for anything. They were doing very, very well for themselves and they were very well known in the community. Well, the money that he was making, even though he was making multiple millions per year, just wasn't enough for Alex and for everything that he wanted and everything he needed and to support his drug habit. So actually, in the early 2000s, he actually started stealing money from his clients and lying about it. When I talk about stealing money from his clients, some of it was really bad things. For instance, his housekeeper actually died on his property and he was supposedly helping the son out, her son, to get a lawsuit against his own insurance policy, which of course you can't even do because it, it was his insurance policy. So it was basically the son suing him, but the son thought that Alex was his attorney, but in the end, he got over $3 million for that son and he took every dime of it. I mean, he was taking tons of money tons of money from his law firm, from his clients, everything. He had a very nice scheme going for himself to get all this money. But you'll see in just a minute that that was starting to come to an end. So now we get to June of 2021 and we're going to start with the times now because this is where the times get really important. Okay. So Alex wakes up, he does whatever he does, and at 12.06, he gets to work that day. While he is at work that day, the office manager, basically, the office, the head office accountant, I can't remember what her title was, but she actually was presented from, I think it's one of his, like, secretaries, a strange check, and she confronts Alex about it. It looked like he was restructuring fees. Now at this time she hadn't uncovered the multi-million dollar scheme that he had going of stealing all this money from the law firm, from his clients, from everyone. She hadn't uncovered that, okay? We're just talking the tip of the iceberg, the tippy tip 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 of the iceberg here. But there was this one check, it was a little fishy, she had to go and confront him with it that day. Now, she thought that he was just restructuring some of the fees that he would be receiving for his payment from the law firm. She thought he was doing that because, remember the boat accident that I talked about? He was actually getting sued in a civil case because the reason he was getting sued was because Paul, his youngest son, was using his oldest son's ID, I believe it was to buy alcohol, and because he knew about that, they were suing him about the boat crash because of negligent parenting. Now, even the attorneys that got on the stand and talked about this basically said it was a frivolous lawsuit and it was not going to go anywhere, but they were suing for millions of dollars. And remember, Alex, even though he makes tons of money, he doesn't have that kind of money. He's having to 
they borrow steel literally from everyone that he can and lying and lying and lying he doesn't have that kind of money to be able to pay off this boat thing so he's freaking out in his head and he actually had gone to the lady at the law firm and was trying to restructure some of the fees so in his financial records it didn't look like he had that much money she thinks that this is just a check that's restructuring those fees but it's off but no one at the time thought that Alex would be lying and stealing this this money from the firm although he was confronted by her at that day so did him in his paranoid drug mind think that you know his whole scheme was going down we don't know we don't know what he thought or did he think that it was just no big deal and he can handle it and he can keep his scheme going on he basically alluded to that he thought it was no big deal that day. It was a very short conversation while he was at work with her because he got a phone call from one of his brothers, I believe, that said that his dad was going back into the hospital. His dad had cancer and was going back into the hospital and was pretty sick. And so she cut the conversation short and that's where that ended for the day. Now at 6.42, Alex had left work and he got home to his property called the Moselle property. Now the Moselle property is basically their huge hunting property house, everything like that. And Alex mostly lived at this Moselle property. They also had a beachfront property. And that's where Maggie liked to spend a lot of her time because she loved the beach. But everyone says, everyone who got on the stand, even people who didn't like Alex at all. They talked so much about how him and his wife were lovey-dovey, how Maggie was his all, and what a wonderful couple they were. And as far as the, the boys, that Alec never raised his voice to the boys or his wife. No one's ever seen anything like that. That he's this like perfect husband, perfect father, perfect family man. But they also thought he was this perfect lawyer and this perfect person too. So was there stuff going on behind closed doors that we don't know about? I don't know. So anyway, at 642, Alec gets back home to the Moselle property, okay, which is like a huge hunting property. It's 1,700 acres. It is just ginormous. At one end of the property, there is a, a really nice house, and then there's a side road off the main road and that is like dog kennels and and uh, a shed and, and some other stuff out there. At 7.04, his son Paul gets back to Moselle property, gets home basically because Paul would love to hang out there and he spent a lot of his time there because Paul loved to go hunting on the property. He would hunt for hogs, he would hunt for doves, he would hunt for turkeys, he would hunt for all kinds of stuff. So he was on the on the property and he had come home that night and he got home at 7.04. Now at 7.39, Paul's phone recorded a video of Alex, and I'll see if I can find this video, but Paul's phone recorded a video of Alex standing by a, I don't know if it's a fruit tree or whatever, but this fruit tree won't stand up. It keeps falling over and falling over and Alex is trying to hold it. He wants to get it to stand up. But he is wearing a blue button-up shirt and khaki slacks. And you'll notice later that he all of a sudden changes into clean clothes before the cops get there. Very interesting. So why did he change? Why did he take a shower? We're not sure. Was he trying to clean himself up after the murders? Don't know. So that's where we're at though. But he does have um, a white t-shirt and shorts on when the cops show up, which is completely different than what he was wearing two hours prior, basically, in this video. So there's proof that he was wearing this one set of clothes two hours prior. So that's where we're at. At 7.56, Paul posts that video to Snapchat. So everything's going okay. He's hanging out with his dad. Everything seems fine. Everything seems natural. Not a big deal. 
Now at 8.17, Maggie gets home, and the maid had made dinner for all of them. So I know that's really late, but they sat down. It seems from their phone activity and everything like that that they were all at the house. Alex says they sat down, they ate dinner, everything was fine. He can't remember what they talked about, nothing like that. But then he says, at first, and until the trial, until he takes a stand, he says that he actually fell asleep, took a nap, and that he didn't get back up until a little after nine, at which point he was going to go check on his mom, who has dementia, and she has a caretaker with her that looks after her at all times. But at 9.06 p.m., he's going to go check on his mom and see how his mom is doing for the night. Now, it is common for him to go check on his mom every single night, 906 was pretty late though and pretty uncommon for for that though so anyway so they eat dinner this is where things get kind of crazy because paul the youngest son that was murdered okay he was down at the kennels on the property and one of the dogs belonged to his friend so there was there's like 10 kennels i believe on that property they said at one point so there's 10 kennels on this property and they have several dogs and his friend keeps his dog there uh, because it's his hunting dog and he takes his dog home on weekends but during the week while he's working he keeps him at the kennels with Paul. So his dog named Cash was this lab and there was something wrong with Cash's tail and they were talking, Paul and this friend were talking back and forth about this dog's tail and the friend said hey why don't you send me a video so I can see what's going on with his tail so Paul's phone actually records a video and the video is shown to be recorded at 844 Paul and Maggie I do have to say here and even Alex are like phone crazy people they are always texting or calling or have their phones on them, but they are always talking to like multiple people all the time. After 8.44, Paul never ever posts that video. So he took the video of Cash. He is in a conversation with his friend that he was going to post the video so the friend could see what was going on with the dog, but the video never got posted. And what's crazy about the video though is that remember how Alex said that he had laid down after dinner and just taken a nap and he didn't get back up until 906 on the video you can hear Maggie's voice and Alex's voice on the video and Alex said oh no that couldn't have been him that couldn't have been him that couldn't have been him and he lied about it he lied about it when the cops came the cops didn't have the video for a couple months after this accident but he said that the last time that he saw Maggie and Paul was basically at the house at dinner and that he didn't go back down to the kennels. He didn't know and you know, he just got up and went to his mom's house and went and checked on his mom. So that was his story. He didn't realize Paul was recording the Snapchat video that caught his voice down there at 844. Now the times are gonna get really, really, really important here. So hang in there with me. 8.49, Paul's phone locks. The video doesn't get sent. There's no messages out. He's not reading any messages. Nothing happens after 8.49. Paul's phone locks until it dies at 10.34 at night. 8.49, Maggie, while she was there, she was down at the kennels with Paul. She was in the middle of talking to her friends and things like that too. 8.49, Maggie's phone also locks, and it doesn't unlock until it's recovered by police the next day. Whoever killed her had taken her phone and thrown it off the side of the road near the road by the house, and the police did recover it the next day, fortunately, but at 8.49, it locked. The examiners basically estimated their time of death to be at 9 o'clock. Now, that's not a precise science. The coroner even got on the stand and said, look, it could have been eight o'clock, it could have been 10 o'clock, but it's really within that two hour period of time, I can't say for sure. But the main estimated time of death is right in the middle at nine o'clock, okay? So where's Alex? Alec is 
supposedly not at the kennels, because he lied about that, but he was at the kennels at 8.44, because that's when the video caught him down at the kennel. And then, what's really crazy is at 9.02 to 9.06, so for that four minute period, his phone records 283 steps, which one expert was saying, that's close to a quarter kilometer. That's a lot of distance to be covering in four minutes. And during this time, he was also making phone call after phone call to just all kinds of random people. Now, most of them weren't answering or whatever. There wasn't like huge conversations or anything like that. But during that four minute time, he had gone 283 steps, a quarter of a kilometer, and the prosecution is like, well, what are you doing? You know, were you running on a treadmill? Were you doing jumping jacks? What were you doing? All he could say was that he was getting ready to go to his mom's house. And they said, well, you had already changed clothes and you had already eaten dinner and everything like that. What are you doing? And he just said, I don't remember. I was getting ready to go to my mom's house. It just seems a little fishy. Anyway, at 9.06, Alex's phone connects to his Suburban and he calls Maggie's phone. Of course, no answer from Maggie. At 9.07, Alex leaves for the house that's called the Alameda house, which is his parents' house, to go visit his mom. Because dad just went in the hospital, so he went to go visit his mom. So if they were, if Alec had killed them, then he had to have killed them between 8.44, really 8.45, but between 8.45 and 906 when the car when his phone connects to the car with four minutes taken out of that while he's pacing and making phone calls so that leaves him what is that like 10 minutes or so to have killed them cleaned himself up cleaned his guns up gotten in his car and well gotten on his phone walked 283 steps making phone calls all the time, and then got in his car to go hang out at his mom's house. Seems really, really odd. I, I think there's kind of a time discrepancy there, but you know, the defense really didn't even mention that hardly. I guess it doesn't take too long to shoot people, but I would think it would take a while to clean up and dispose of the clothes and dispose of the guns and get those cleaned up so there's not any evidence and I don't know. I don't know. Now, a little bit about Paul and Maggie's murder here, because this is the time that they were murdered, they believe. Paul was shot twice. Um, and I'm not going to get into graphic details. Maggie was shot four times, possibly five times. The defense argued that there could have been two shooters because two different guns were used. One gun was used on Paul. One gun was used on Maggie. So the defense argued that there were two shooters because why would one person pick up two different guns to kill two different people? Uh, the defense also just, I mean, there was so much. There's so much this trial that I can't even go over. It's just crazy. But yeah, they were murdered down at their kennels where they were last heard of from that Snapchat video. And they didn't, after 8.49, both of their phones lock and they stopped responding to texts from friends or texts from family that they were texting and talking to. So, I don't know, I don't know. Did Alec do it? I still don't know, I still don't know. But you know what, we're gonna ask the spirits and I believe in asking the spirits and they'll tell us the truth. So, yeah, the jury found him guilty. He's going to get sentenced. As of the time making this video, he hasn't been sentenced yet. But we know he's getting at least 30 to 40 years. Could be life, of course. Yeah, it's just the jury only took three hours to deliberate. Believed he was guilty like that. I couldn't believe how fast they... No one could believe. I was watching the news. No one could believe how fast they came back with the guilty verdict. But anyway, let's get back into our timeline. So, like I said, at 9.07, Alex leaves for Alameda to visit his mom. 9.08, he's texting Maggie's phone. At 9.22, Alex gets to his mom's house. At 9.33, this is this I thought was really interesting too, and the defense didn't pick up on this at all and really talk about this. But at 9.33, okay, Alex is already at his mom's house, okay? 
But remember how I told you that Maggie's phone was thrown into a field? Basically, or thrown out the window into who knows whatever. Basically, there's nothing around there. Uh, so thrown out into a wooded area that's just alongside the road. Well, at 9.33, her phone's back light comes on. You know how when you pick up your phone and the light comes on? That light came on. So, if Alec is at his mom's house at 9.22... Her phone is showing movement and activity at 9.33. How can that, how can that happen? He would have already had to throw the phone out. Unless maybe he threw it out later. Well, no, because that was the last activity that was shown on her phone. So, I just thought that was something that the defense should have made a much bigger deal about. But I guess they didn't. But I'm not an attorney, so, yeah. Although, they are attorneys and it didn't turn out too well for them. But anyway, 9.33, Maggie's phone backlight comes on. I thought that was very interesting. 10 o'clock, Alex gets back to Moselle, his home property. Here we go. Remember how I said that like 20 seconds matters here? Okay. So at 10 o'clock, Alex arrives back at his property from visiting his mom. He was only there for like 20, 20 minutes or so. The interesting thing about him there is that he pulled around back where there's this shed. And I guess he was kind of outside for a few minutes doing who knows what for who knows how long and then he did go in and visit his mom according to mom's caretaker uh, and he seemed fine at the time he wasn't rattled or anything like that and he left and then he gets back to Moselle at 10 o'clock now at 10.05 he decides that he's going to drive down to the kennels because Maggie and Paul weren't at the house is what he said so he gets to the kennels at 10.05 and 57 seconds. So we're right there, 57 seconds, that's important. At 10.06 and 14 seconds, so less than 20 seconds later, he's on the phone calling 911. So he drives up, he sees the crime scene, he says that he got out and checked the pulses of Maggie and Paul and saw the scene and that he tried to turn Paul over and Paul's phone popped out of his pocket and he didn't know what to do with it, so he put the phone back on Paul and left it alone. And then he called 911. That's what he told cops later. But how did he do that in literally 17 seconds? 17 seconds. So was he just so distraught he forgot whether he was doing it while he was on the phone with 911 or before? I don't know. I think that's something that you would remember. That you ran up to the scene first. You tried to check them. You tried to check their pulse. You tried to see what was going on. And then you called 911. I would run up. I would run up to them. I would run up to them. I think that's reasonable. And then call 911. And then later when he testified, he said, I don't remember that. That's not what I believe happened. I believe that while I was on the phone with 911, I was checking them. And that's when Paul's phone popped out and all that. But to the detectives, they caught him when he was describing the situation that he he alluded to the fact that he had done that before he had called 911. So again, discrepancies. Again, we know Alex is a huge liar. He's still in money. He's, I, I don't think a single word that comes out of his mouth is the truth. He, I just don't think he knows how to tell the truth. He's just he can't do it, even if it's to save his own life from going to jail and all that. He can't do it. He has to lie. But, but yeah, so there's where we're at there. There's our crazy 20 second twist. He's on the phone with a 911 operator and he tells her that he's worried that someone's on the property or anything like that. So he's going to go down to the house and get a gun. So he goes and he gets a gun, a shotgun, the same type of shotgun that could have killed a son. Uh, yeah. And at 10.17, the 911 call ends. Police arrive on the scene, check the scene out, do an interview with him a little later. He lies about being down at the kennels, not realizing he was going to get caught by a video at the scene of the murders minutes before they happened, supposedly. Now, if you're like me, you're thinking, okay, well, why all of a sudden, if he was such a great father and such a great husband, would he murder his wife and kids in South Carolina? In the court system, you don't have to prove motive, but the prosecution talked about a gathering storm, and that was the boat accident, 
lawsuit that was going on that was him getting busted more about his medicine, his pills, back in May. And also on that day that he got confronted about the money at the law firm. If the prosecution says that basically that bought him sympathy and bought him some time so he could deal with those things. And by that, I mean the murder of his wife and his son, the brutal murder of his wife and his son. Did it buy him time? A little bit, Then, and it did help. The civil suit was dropped for the boat accident, so he didn't have to pay that money. The civil suit was dropped. The law firm stopped asking questions about him, you know, about the checks and everything like that. They just kind of pushed it to the side. His son and his wife weren't there to confront him about his drug habit, so it did help. For about a month, it helped. And then the law firm started uncovering more and more and more of his misappropriation of funds. Now we get to September 4th, and this was brought in trial because I think the defense ended up bringing it in somehow. So of course the prosecution took complete advantage of it. But on September 4th, he was confronted by, I believe it was one of his partners in the law firm about all this money because they started digging and digging and digging from June through September and they had found where he had stolen a lot of money from the firm, a lot of fees, a lot of the money that goes to the clients. He had taken so much money, like I said, to the tune of multiple millions of dollars. So he was confronted on September 4th about that. And within two hours, they said, within two hours of being confronted, Alex was on the side of the road, supposedly changing a tire, and this guy drives up and shoots him in the head. But just grazes him on the side of his head, doesn't actually kill him or anything like that. Turns out, though, that this is like his drug dealer? And Alec knew that he had a $12 million life insurance policy on him? and he wanted to be killed so that his oldest son, Buster, would get that $12 million. So he was basically, he knew his world had crumbled on September 4th, and a couple hours later, he hires his drug dealer to basically come shoot him in the head and kill him so his son can get the money before he becomes the super disgraced attorney that he has become. Because on uh, September 9th, um, he has to resign from the law firm, obviously, for obvious reasons. They caught him stealing millions and lying. On September 8th, his law license was suspended. And there you have it, folks. That's kind of the timeline. That's the timeline starting February of 2019 and going all the way through September 8th of 2021 and everything that happened. So that's kind of to catch you up on the case. Now, this trial went for six weeks, and we're talking five days a week for six weeks. So clearly I'm going to miss a lot of stuff. Uh, but I just want to give you a timeline, fill you in a little bit, so you know who we're going to be trying to contact on the Spirit Box. We're gonna try and talk to Maggie and Paul. And let's get into that. I use a PSB7 Spirit Box, nothing fancy. It's just connected regular cord to an old speaker. A couple of rules with doing the spirit box, I guess you could say, like little housekeeping things that we do around here and we talk about around here, is I don't cut and edit my spirit box sessions. I like them to be 100% real, 100% raw. You guys hear what I hear. So I don't cut out anything. Um, I do have a professional that reviews my spirit box sessions with me. So he was in the Navy for 10 years and he kind of was like a spy. It's kind of cool what he did, you know, but he listened like through with the cans on, listening to radio stuff and pulling out everything from the radio and sending it on up to people, including the President of the United States. So that's what he did. And he helps me with the Spirit Box sessions to make sure everything I hear is true and correct and yeah we work really well together doing that don't worry if someone needs help crossing over okay i know that people have been worried before because sometimes when i do these videos at the end i forget to say oh can you help them cross over uh ethan and e will help cross over now who are ethan and e ethan and e are my spirit guides you can call them angels you can call them whatever you want but they are the ones that unfortunately got assigned to me and are stuck with me. So the poor things, but 
they will help cross someone over if it needs to be crushed, if they need to be crushed over. Uh, the spirit box noise completely sucks. I'm so sorry. So get ready for the noise. It's going to be really loud. I can't do anything about that because I do like the PSP7. I think it's a lot more real and I get a lot better results from the PSP7. So that's what we're going to do. I'm going to go ahead, get this all set up and I will be right back. super clear super good session I can't wait to hear that back I heard a lot of things I want to know what you guys think do you guys think he's innocent do you guys think he's guilty I want to know in the comments below so please let me know we've got what the jury thinks already and by the time we're at this point in the video you guys are gonna know what the spirit world said yeah what do you guys think I don't know I he had like 10 minutes like 10 minutes to shoot his wife and his son and clean up and 10 minutes is not that long so I, mm, I guess you could do it though because I think he did it so uh, it, it's so hard though I don't know I don't know whatever it is he was found guilty and he will be serving a lot of time in jail and uh, I hope you guys are doing good changing the subject here <laughs> but I hope you guys are doing good and I'm sorry it's been a while since I've been on but I will be back on very soon I have some cool videos that we're going to be doing coming up very very soon so I will see you next time love y'all goodbye